Welcome back. Uh, as we get set for this final session, I do ask for your cooperation. I do know that we do need to venture out, maybe answer a call or two. Uh, during this final session, we will be closing the door to my right, which is the door closest to the sound at the back. If you do need to enter and exit, we do ask that you use the doors on my left. So we'd appreciate that if you're able to do that for us. Now, our final session of the 14th Annual Cayman Islands Healthcare Conference, Bridging the Gap Between Patient and Practitioner. Our final presenter, Dr. Karina davis Irons, is a consultant anesthesist at the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority. She's going to speak to us on the topic of clinical ethics and patient-centered healthcare. I think that's a fitting way to bring this conference to an end. Remember, we're talking about bridging the gap between patient and a practitioner. So clinical ethics and patient-centered healthcare. Let's welcome Dr. Davis Irons. Good morning, esteemed guests and colleagues. Thank the organizers for having me present at this esteemed conference. I do appreciate the opportunity. Now, today I would like to engage you as we continue to close the gap between patient and practitioner. In fact, I want not only for us to narrow this gap, but I want us to close it. As we try to close this gap, we recognize the importance of healthcare with respect to patient care and the evolution that has taken place over the past two to three decades. What has happened with healthcare and the approach we as healthcare professionals take to healthcare is that we moved away from a pater paternalistic approach. And this paternalistic approach is an approach where traditionally healthcare professionals would dictate management plans and choices to patients. We've moved away from that approach and there is great emphasis being placed on patients being the center of their management and the center of their decisions when it comes on to healthcare. So as we move from this, from the traditional approach to the patient-centered approach, we don't only want to encourage our patients to be the center of their care, but we also want to empower them. We have to provide them with the information and let them feel comfortable and empowered to take on their role in their health care. So this discussion will be based on three main objectives. We'll emphasize the pivotal role the patient plays in making decisions with regards to their health, whether it be in the confines of our environment or outside the confines of our environment. I will also look at the role that the basic ethical principles play in the forming the foundation or background rather, backbone rather, of patient-centered healthcare. Lastly, we look at shared decision making. So we'll place some emphasis on shared decision making and more specifically, on informed consent, which has gotten a lot of attention, particularly over the last decade, as we move towards more patient-centered care. Now, deliberately, for the purpose of discussion, this discussion, I will use the term healthcare professionals very often. Reason being, when we talk about patient-centered care, oftentimes it is assumed that we're talking about the patient-doctor relationship. This is not so. This relationship has to do with any individual who gives care and or service to a patient, either directly or indirectly. We all have a role to play in patient-centered patient care. So this, may, this role may be clinical or it may be non-clinical. So as we start this discussion, we start at the foundation. When you encounter your patient, you start to form a relationship with your patient. 
the foundation of every relationship, and particularly for the health professional and the patient, is trust. Our patients need to trust us. We must have open and honest communication with our patients. At the same time, a good relationship would involve us having mutual respect for each other. Not only do we want to respect our patients' privacy and dignity, but importantly, especially for the purpose of patient-centered care, we must respect their choices. Now, patient-centered care prioritizes dignity and unique needs of the patient. It is characterized by us as healthcare professionals expressing compassion and respect, as mentioned before. Now, there are two things that we must recognize. Patients need to feel like they're in control of what is happening with their health. They need to feel a sense of control of their healthcare journey. And it is our responsibility of healthcare, as healthcare professionals to empower them to do so. Patients typically live, as with anybody else, lives in the, live independent lives. Now what happens when our patients come through the door to our institution or our facility? They leave that independence at the door. Now what we want to do is to have them bring that independence through the door and continue it along their healthcare journey. Patients tend to, there are some patients who will leave this independence at the door and put all the dependence on the healthcare professionals. That's a lot of burden for us to carry as well. What we want to do is to empower those patients to continue that independence and take control of their healthcare. As healthcare professionals, we need to ensure at the same time that the care that we're providing to patients are not only personalized but also coordinated amongst the various professionals. So as healthcare providers, either working alone with the patient or in collaboration with other healthcare professionals, we need to identify what the patient needs. When we recognize what the patient needs, we need, we need to also understand what is important to the patient. So we establish what they need, but what is most important to this patient we support them through the process. We provide them with all the information that they would need to make decisions. And when they make a decision, we respect their decision and we support them through their decision. Now the backbone of patient-centered care lies with the basics of medical, medical ethics principles. And these principles guide healthcare professionals in making decisions that prioritizes the well-being and the rights of patients. These include autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, as well as justice. Now, autonomy arguably is the most important principle, ethical principle, when we speak about patient-centered healthcare. Why is this? Because autonomy underscores the patient's right to make their own decision. And this is not only an ethical principle, but it is also a legal requirement as well. The patient has a right to make their own decision. Now, patient-centered healthcare respects the autonomy of these patients by providing them with the comprehensive information they need and involving them at every stage of the decision-making process. Beneficence, the principle of Beneficence is that healthcare providers must act in the best interest of the patient. Now, one would argue, and we oftentimes come across situations where there is a conflict between different principles. Our patient may autonomously make a decision that we think as healthcare professionals and with our clinical expertise is not in their best interest. So this is where sitting down and having discussions with the patient become very important. So with patient-centered healthcare, you try to tailor the treatment and plans to meet the specific needs and preferences of that individual. 
What you're trying to achieve is to have an overall well, to achieve the overall well-being of the patient, maximize the overall well-being of the patient, as well as their quality of life. And we should not underestimate the importance of quality of life. My quality of life can be defined significantly different from someone else's quality of life. For example, a patient who leads a sedentary lifestyle may not be significantly affected if they're on a medication that causes them to be fatigued or impairs their, their muscular function. However, somebody who is a marathon runner or somebody who is always active, lives a, lives a very active lifestyle, may think that their quality of life is significantly affected if they are exposed to such type of treatment. So we have to recognize that each individual patient defines quality of life differently. And this becomes even more important at the end of life when there are patients who are dealing with decision-making decision processes at the end of their life. The principle of non-maleficence is another one that oftentimes may have some conflict with autonomy. And the principle of non-maleficence is that the healthcare provider must avoid causing harm to patients. Again, if a patient makes a decision that you think is not in their best interest, there is a possibility that it may impose harm on them. So again, this is where the active discussion takes place and can become very important. Last but not least, justice. There is a role for, there is a role for justice in patient-centered care, even though justice looks on a more broader scale. Where does it lie? With healthcare resources. Healthcare resources should be allocated fairly and without discrimination. So patient-centered care promotes equity by ensuring that all patients receive the necessary support and treatment regardless of their background or circumstances. There are a few other principles that I'll mention here. And the first one is, what about the patient's rights and dignity? So we've established autonomy. There are other things that we need to consider such as culture, social, and personal values. And I'll pause here for us to, sit, to look back and reflect on our island here. It's multicultural. We as healthcare professionals must have cultural sensitivity. We must educate ourselves about cultural sensitivity. And as we respect cultural sensitivity, that will enable us to care for our patients on a different level that allows more trust and inclusivity. So we have to consider that as well. Now stemming from the ethical theory of virtue is veracity. Healthcare providers should communicate truthfully and honestly with patients. Confidentiality is also extremely important. Patients trust us with their information. And as, as they trust us with their information, patient-centered care prioritizes us to protect that information and ensure the sensitive, the sensitive data is handled securely and only shared with those directly involved in their care. Now let us look more specifically at shared decision-making. So as the name suggests, shared decision-making is a decision that is made not by the physician for the patient, but made with the patient. And this is not new, but it's been developing rapidly over the past two decades. It was first reported by Robert Vich in 1972. Even though autonomy, the principle of autonomy existed long before 2000, there has been rapid development and emphasis on it since about 2000. So there has been a paradigm shift a paradigm shift from a paternalistic approach to a more pa patient-centered approach, with a lot of em emphasis again most recently being placed on informed consent. Shared decision-making involves having good conversations with our patients. It may sound simple, 
but it is very important if we want to get the end result of holistic treatment and all the things we spoke about earlier, Dr. Bloomfield, for example. So we need to have good fun conversations with our patients so we can make good decisions with our patients and collaboratively with other healthcare professionals. Patients should be supported through this process to understand what is happening to them, understand what choices are available. Then they're able to make good decisions about their preferred course of action based on reliable, evidence-based, good quality information, and, and their own personal preferences. And this should all be done within a time frame that is adequate for them to process all this information. So there is growing evidence to suggest that there are many benefits from this shared decision-making process. There, are, there is improved outcomes for patients, improved patient satisfaction, and also improved staff satisfaction. Shared decision-making facilitates self-management and self-care, which underscores this, the independence that we spoke about earlier. So the patient takes control. It's self-management and it's self-care. And this self-care and self-management ultimately reduces complications. This process is relevant in any situation where a healthcare decision needs to be made and a range of options is available. So let's take, for example, a patient, a surgical patient. There are many disciplines involved in the management of this patient. Each group of professional healthcare workers involved in this management will have a discussion with the patient, which would, should be on the basis of shared decision making. There is what is known as the lay expertise. What is the lay expertise? So, the lay expertise is the patient being the recipient of the information with respect to clinical expertise, putting that together with their personal preference, and then, at the end of the day, the way they interpret it and the decisions they make will be based on their lay expertise. So it is very important the way we provide them the information, ensure that it is in a language they understand, because at the end of the day, the lay expertise is considered equal to the clinical expertise. So us teaching our patients and informing them about everything with their treatment plan, the way we do it is very important. So the shared decision process. It begins where you have a relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient, based on the principles we spoke of before. So there is a foundation of trust, there is a foundation of mutual respect. So there is already a relationship between the healthcare professional and the patient. Within that relationship now will come a discussion about best evidence, clinical expertise, the patient expertise, so we're now forming the lay expertise, and the individual patient preference. The patient and the healthcare professional become partners. What is important after they become partners and had this discussion? What matters to you? What matters to the patient? So that's the question. What matters to you, the patient? After having that discussion, together, the healthcare professional and the patient makes a decision. It is a professional commitment, right? Um, the aim is to, make, is to create the right management at the right time that is right for that patient. It is intrinsic in many professional codes of conduct and this is becoming more and more frequent. We're seeing it more and more in professional conducts. And there was a thought in the past that patients don't want to know too much information. Studies have shown that this is in fact not true, and it's, it, it's being supported more and more as the years go by as patients develop more autonomy and want to have more interest in everything, not just their healthcare, but everything. 
It is also a legal requirement. The patient-centric approach taken by the courts most recently require healthcare professionals to be skilled not only at delivering treatment, but also at consulting with patients and ensuring that they are empowered to make fully informed decisions about their health. So it is a professional commitment and obligation, but it's also a legal requirement. The following cases marked a shift in the law away from medical paternalistic approach to informed consent. Sorry. The following cases marked a shift in the law away from the medical paternalistic approach to informed consent toward a more patient-centered approach, stemming all the way from Canada in 1980 and most recently in the UK 2015 with the Montgomery um, case. And I would encourage everyone to take a look, all healthcare professionals to take a look at that particular case, the Montgomery case. That case caused a significant shift in the way informed consent has been done over the past years among medical professionals. So where are we now? So, even though there has been much um, advocating for patient-centered care, the Quality Care Commission, the Care Quality Commission in 2020 reported that 23% of patients reported that doctors talked in front of them as though they weren't there. And 11% reported that they had not been involved in the decisions about their care and treatment as much as they'd want to be. And this is actually an improvement. So it was coming from much worse but there's still a lot of room for improvement. So ultimately, we want to start by preparing the public, preparing our patients, empowering them. Encourage our patients to ask questions, not to be afraid. There is a real term called iatrophobia, where patients are afraid of doctors, patients are afraid of hospitals, and even if they do present, they are afraid to even speak to us. They are afraid to ask us questions. So we start by preparing the public, educating them, and let them know that it is okay to ask. It is okay to be involved. Of course, this will require strong leadership at the institution level. Implementing different tools, implementing training, et cetera, that will help the staff to accomplish this shared decision-making process. And of course, while doing that, we have to audit ourselves and see how well we're doing at it, because it's real and it does impact on patient care ultimately. So we want to first look at our current services. What are we doing? And define the priorities. It may require a shift in culture, may require a shift in our system, but is it worth it? Absolutely. Ensure that there is appropriate training, there are appropriate training programs. Ensure that written, and, written information and conversation are health literate, and this is very important. Research has shown, research has shown that 40 to 80% of patients will leave a consultation with a physician not having any idea what was said and any clarity on the care, the care plan for them. So we have to ensure that the communication with the patient, and this requires training. It, it really just doesn't happen automatically. We, we tend to think that we know this, we got this, we know exactly how to do it. But there is a role for training in this respect. So there are countries, there are jurisdictions that have developed different decision support tools that help us as, as healthcare professionals develop this, this language and develop this uh, uh, competency with this um, process. There is also the brand, the brand method um, where it helps us ethically as well as legally, remembering brand. So it, what it does is like a checklist when you're having discussions with your patient, particularly with consent, to remember to discuss with the patient benefits, risks, alternatives, as well as the option of doing nothing when it is appropriate. The teach-back method. 
So the teach back method, we should not confuse, we, we should not confuse the teach back, teach back method as a way of assessing what the patient knows. It is a way of assessing how well we've imparted that information on the patient. So it's an assessment of how well a job we have done in explaining to the patient what is happening with them. It should be used by everyone with everyone. It avoids the use of closed-ended questions. We encourage open-ended questions so patients can elaborate and ask questions and feel comfortable to do so. It takes a lot of time to learn, but, and it does require practice, but again, it is worth it. As mentioned before, there are patients that are afraid to ask questions. Why? Because they think they may be taking up our time. They may think we think their questions are stupid or irrelevant. They may feel that they may come across as being difficult patients. They may think that their care will be affected about how we perceive them, if we perceive them as being difficult patients. And we want to get rid of that um, fear within our patients. And of course, you have those patients that really want the doctor or the healthcare professional to tell them what to do which is what we want to avoid. We want to involve them in the process at all times. So there are many benefits to shared decision-making, specifically for the patient. They have increased knowledge. They have a shared responsibility for their decision. They have more realistic expectations from their treatment. In many cases, they have better health outcomes. And decisions and choices tend more to align with their preferences. From the, the healthcare professional perspective, it helps to reduce geographical variations in our care. It improves patient satisfaction, which we all want. And it in encourages adherence to treatment. And it also helps us to identify high-risk decisions for individual patients. Now looking more specifically at informed consent, which has gained a lot of attention over the past 10 years or more. Informed consent is, a, is, a, is an aspect of shared decision making, which is patient centric as well, and has to be assessed from the perspective of the patient. Now informed consent has quite a large ethical arm, and it has very strong legal backing as well. For a consent to be valid, the patient must do so voluntarily based on information that is provided to them, provided they have the capacity to make decisions. And those three conditions are required for legal validity of any informed consent. How would we achieve that? By having shared decision making, a shared discussion with our patients. We need to rec remember though that shared informed consent process can be context dependent. What does that mean? So a patient going for an elective surgery may have a different perspective in terms of the decision they make at that time versus going for an emergency surgery where their life or their limb or their sight might be at risk. So we have to bear that in mind as well. So now let's just look on a scenario. We have a 26-year-old female with a young daughter who is requesting contraception as she started a new relationship. We're going to look at three approaches to having a discussion with this patient. The first one is the paternalistic approach. So the doctor says, we find that most women in your situation choose a coil. And that's what I would recommend for you. Let me tell you about the risks and the benefits. The informative approach. So the doctor says, there are lots of choices available. I have a comprehensive information booklet here about all the options and their risks and benefits. Why don't you have a good look at that and let me know which you prefer? 
Then we have the shared decision making, and I'm sure we'd all agree that this looks like the better approach, the best approach rather. The doctor says, what matters to you most about the choice of contraception? Is it reliability, minimal side effects, impact on your bleeding pattern, or something else? Tell me. The patient says, well, the most important thing for me, doctor, is not to get pregnant so early in a new relationship. So I would like the most reliable method. So the patient doesn't care about the bleeding. What the patient wants is the most reliable method. So the doctor says, there are several options, including X, Y, Z. Given that not becoming pregnant is your most important consideration, I would probably recommend the combined pill, assuming there aren't any contraindications. What do you know about the pill? And then the conversation would go on, and then the patient would make an informed decision. Now lastly, I want to look at what is known as a material risk. And the same case that I mentioned before, Montgomery, that changed a lot of informed, uh, the way we do informed consent um, over the past several years, it defined material risk. And a material risk is one in which a reasonable person, so now we've moved away from Bolam's test, which looked at the reasonable physician and the decision that the reasonable physician would make to a reasonable person, a reasonable patient. So it's one in which a reasonable person in the patient's position would be likely to attach significance to the risk. Or the doctor is or should be reasonably aware that the particular patient would be likely to attach significance to it. So let me just give you a few examples. There is, um, you have a dentist, and the dentist requires hand surgery. The material risk for this dentist is real, if it is that he will lose function in the hand. Will it matter to someone whose job is not dependent on their hands? The risk probably wouldn't be material for them, but for this doctor, that risk is material. We can also look at what about a single parent who has four children to take care of, the youngest being a few months, and she's going for eye surgery. There is a possibility that she may have impaired vision for a few days. How will she manage? How will she care for her four children if she has no assistance? So that material risk is real for her. If, if, if it is even a 0.001% chance that she may have impaired vision for weeks, this is a real risk to her. It may not be to her neighbor, it may not be to me, but it is a material risk for her. So um, material risk has been getting a lot of attention with respect to informed consent. I must admit, it might not be the easiest to identify, but with the shared decision-making process and engaging our patients more, we may be able to identify those risks easier. So in summary, the way we communicate with patients who use healthcare services can be difficult for them to understand. We can change our conversation with patients to ensure they are truly at the heart of every decision made. Shifting from what's wrong with you, what do you want me to do for you, to what matters to you most, and does this work for you? Shared decision-making means working together to ensure patients using our services feel better engaged with their care, are clear on all their options, choose treatments based on what helps them best to meet their needs. This way, we are likely to have less decision regret and, adher and adherence to their decisions and to their treatment plan because their choice was preference-based. So in conclusion, let us continue to work collectively
towards a healthcare system that values and prioritizes the needs and preferences of each and every patient. Thank you.